All right, so this is lecture 12. It's using encryption wisely, and after we learn today about Apple Pay, we're finally using it wisely. Ain't that right, Cameron? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he will never live it down. All right. Yeah, the first bullet here basically says encryption gives us a false sense of security. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. People said, I got WEP. I'm oh. secure, but look how long WEP lasted. Everyone know what WEP stands for? Wired Equivalency Protocol. Some people thought it was wired encryption. No, it's wired equivalency. The initial intent was to make it as secure as a wired connection, which didn't work out. Okay. I mean, if you think back to the Caesar Cipher, the first thing we learned about back then, wow, that's awesome. But did it last? This, did, it, did it last? No, it did not. Okay. And that was the veneer cipher. We don't know exactly how long the Caesar Cypher lasts. I think about a week. About a week. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> we joke about that, but if you think, we get new technologies today. Okay, but think, you know, oh, this freaking crap on my screen here. What if you had, you know, if you hadn't heard about an iPhone or an Android or something, hadn't never seen a cell phone, you wouldn't know what they are. So back then, we didn't know about anything else. So wow, the Caesar Cypher was pretty darn amazing. So you know, it's just that now we know better, so now it seems easy to us. All right, it says must be used correctly. A lot of times, you know, we, we learned in DES there's a bunch of different types of weak keys, like keys that are all zeros or all ones, which is stupid. But also the president of Syria's password was one, two, three, four, five. He knew better than that. So, you know, you need to use it correctly, and um, it's like antivirus. You know, when you get a computer, you get free antivirus for 90 days. Then what happens after 90 days? It just doesn't get updated. <laughs> yeah, some of us know and get other ones replaced it or something, but a lot of people don't. They, or they don't turn stuff on, or they don't change passwords, stuff like that. Does anyone ever change their default passwords on stuff? Yeah, but there's some devices you can't. If I remember right, the Paradigm modem I had for my DSL service, the username was the second half of the MAC address. The password was the first half, and you couldn't change it. I mean, yeah, no one's ever going to guess that, but if you broke into my house and knew I had a Paradise modem or Paradigm modem, then you already can get in. So it's kind of, were they really using encryption correctly? No, I don't think so, okay? There's also a lot of best practices out there. Um, what happens in this world is someone figures something out and other people adopt it. Obviously NFC, you know, Google made it, Apple's now using it, okay? Same way with a lot of things, okay? Um, did anyone ever mess with IPX, SPX? It's the old Novell protocol. It was much faster than TCP IP. Much faster, much better, but no one uses it. Okay, but because we adopted IP4. So what happens though is people start doing something, the other people jump on the bandwagon and start using it, and then you know, same happens in encryption. People start making something, using something, and, and it's one of those deals that the more it's used, the cheaper it gets, the better it gets, the more updated it gets, okay? And there's a lot of different protocols. Obviously, we talked about quite a few of the different ones already, but there's lots of them out there. Now let's talk about performance. There are definitely two questions on the test based on this, okay? Delay time. Now, stream ciphers, the way you read this is stream ciphers has less or equal to a delay than stream block, which is less than or equal to block, okay? What, excuse me, what that means is a stream cipher, does it encrypt one bit at a time or an entire block at a time? Actually, stream is a bit at a time. It, a stream, as I'm typing, okay, it actually does one, it, it, it encrypts as it's going across, okay? And the faster the typer or the faster the data, obviously the faster encryption, okay? So the delay time of the stream is less. Say we got Cameron over there who types five words a minute. Okay. So we're waiting on this entire document to be typed. Okay. 
So we'd have less of a delay waiting on Cameron than if we did a block. Because if we did a block, it might take Cameron three hours to fill up the block. Okay? So. All right. No. I don't know how fast he types. But. <laughs> Faster than the slow person. That's what it is. Okay. So Des is a 64-bit block. What in the heck? Is that, is that tipping next door? No. Oh, jeez. Okay. So Des is a 64-bit block. RSA is a 100 to 200-bit block. Okay. So it's a lot bigger blocks. Okay. Now let's talk about speed. Symmetric are 10,000 or more times faster. Why would they be so much faster? Well, you encrypt and decrypt normally with the same algorithm, just in the same key. We all have the same key. We don't have to worry about two things. And they just are. They're a lot faster. Okay. Now, this next part, we've actually had a discussion going on for a couple weeks now. All right. So I have a Linksys wireless router in my office. You all know what I'm talking about. The W, G, T, A, B, C, D, G thing, whatever it is. Okay. Has a firewall built in. Okay? Is a hardware or software? Firewall software. But, okay, so we got a router upstairs with a firewall bin built into it. A Cisco router. Is that hardware or software? Well, the, the point we came to is, okay, it's a hardware device, but the hardware device is running software. So what is it? Is it a hardware? Because every Hard piece of hardware, hardware is running software. So if I buy a Cisco or a PIX firewall, mm -hmm. that's considered a hardware firewall. But it's really a piece of equipment running software, so it's really software. See what I'm saying? We were discussing this the other week, and we don't know the answer. But normally I would consider that wireless router in my office a hardware router, because that's what it does. We consider a software firewall would be like the Windows firewall. But it brought up a very good point. Hardware routers still run software, so aren't they software? See, our router upstairs is running iOS version 12.1. Software version 12, so it's running software, mm -hmm. but it's running a hardware time. I just, I'm just asking the question we don't know the answer to. It just made up a very good question. But normally hardware is much faster than software. Because okay? software, if you think of like the Windows firewall, it runs on top of Windows, so it's doing a lot of other stuff. Where a hardware-based device is pretty much doing one thing. Okay. And if you're doing one thing, you're hopefully good at it. It's like Google advertising, they're good at it. Making cell phones, they suck. So, you know. <laughs> Still like my Android. <laughs> All right, RSA. It says 220,000 bits versus 0.5K on software. That's a big difference. So look at the speed. The hardware is 220,000 bits per second compared to 0.5,000 bits per second. That's a massive speed increase. I feel like normally hardware is doing one thing. That's what it was made to do. Okay. Des, 1.2 million thousands. That's a lot. Compared with 400,000. So you can see hardware implementations are much faster. Okay. That's why you know, when people ask, you know, do you have a, you know, do you want a firewall? It's usually best if you just get a hardware one, even if it's the Linksys one. And uh, I actually did a project using a Linksys router, a home router, oh, quite a few semesters ago. And I had the students use something called HPing3. Has anyone ever heard of it? It's like ping on steroids. You know what ping is? Packet Internet Groper, it actually just checks for connectivity. HPIN can do all that plus a million other things. You can make fake packets, you can do anything with it. Well, with HPIN 3, you can actually tell it to send out like 400,000 packets per second from bogus addresses. Well, it's funny because I assigned that project, instantly the router crashed. I'm like, what happened? 
Because I told the students, I said, once you start this, you need to stop it right away because it's sending out 400,000 packets per second. An entire class doing that, and if they don't stop it, you can imagine how many packets that is. But um, yeah, the router would crash. I'm like, oh, crap. Would reboot it. Crash instantly. It's like, so you know, now we have a Cisco router, which we use, and it works fine. But it was a very good point that home use routers can't handle 400,000 packets per second, even from one person. So, it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Okay. Now let's talk about block replay. Okay, what they're talking, this is just kind of an example. Okay. So what if I had, you know, a source account is one block, a destination account is one block, and an amount is one block. Okay. Could we actually... Duplicate blocks or change blocks. Yes. We could play blocks. You know, way back when, when I learned networking, years ago, <coughs> there was a video, which I wish I could find again, of an old ATM. Actually, it's still a lot of ATMs nowadays are still analog. They still dial up on the phone. I don't know if you realize that. Well, in that video, they showed an ATM where people were robbing it. And the way they got caught was they recorded the phone conversation of the ATM to the bank. Then he kept playing it back. Play it back to the ATM. They caught a guy standing out from the ATM with a bag, brown paper bag, collecting the money. And they would just keep playing the recording to the ATM and it would keep sending out the money because that's what they were doing. They were replaying the transmission over and over and over. Okay? So, it's not a good thing, okay? Mm -hmm. That's why we learned a little bit of block chaining last time. You want the blocks to be linked together, and you don't want them to be able to go in and just modify one, maybe change it from John Doe to somebody else, okay? So there's been a lot of stuff done in this area, and that's SSL and obviously Apple Pay, which is wonderful. <laughs> okay, so there's been a lot done in there. Block chaining. We, we mentioned this last time where we have one block chained to another block, and that symbol is XOR, and remember XOR is one or the other, but not both. Okay. So one or the other, but not both. We could also encrypt a packet with a key, then take that resulting packet, XOR it with the next packet, encrypt that with a key, and so on and so forth. So that's the way it's done. Decrypting basically done the same way. Because what's happening that way, if the blocks, even if it was the same block over and over, since we are chaining them together, the values would end up being cha changed. So, works very good. Okay, initial chaining value, there's issues with that. Like they say here, suppose a message always started with U.S. Army HQ. It's not a good idea to have you know, a beginning that's always the same because then people could determine what it is based on that. You don't want one that's always the same like they have here, okay? You want what's called an initialization vector that's, a vector that's random. Because okay? anything that's hard-coded is just a, it's a bad thing, okay? That's kind of what that's saying there, okay? One-way encryption, okay? I kind of made a slide a few weeks ago when I showed the car window I want to talk about hash values. You know, you can take the window and smash it into a billion pieces, but you can't take the billion pieces and put it back together into the window. Okay? All right. So what they're talking about here is when you get to hashing functions, like they're saying here, they're very hard to reverse. You can't. You can't. And that's what you want. You do not want to be able to reverse the hash. Okay? And what you would end up doing is you would end up storing the password that's been ran through this function. Then the user enters something, enters their new password, then it compares. So a lot of people say, well, how do I compare the passwords? Well, I encrypted it with SHA-1 or whatever. So when I go to log into this machine, it takes what I'm logging in with, encrypts that the same way, then just compares the hashes. Okay. So easy enough there. Okay. Also cryptographic sealing. This gives us integrity compared to secrecy. So can you ever think of something that you don't really care if people see, you just want to make sure it's real? How about deeds to property? You want them to be visible to everybody, but you want to make sure it's the right thing. Uh, I was actually reading an article this weekend 
some state, there was an issue with a uh, land survey that happened. And this couple built a brand new house 100% entirely on the neighbor's property. Entire house. It was built three feet over the line. And the entire house, you got line here, house is three feet and over. And it was the builder's fault that someone did a survey and it wasn't verified. They didn't go back and check the records. That's what the whole deed thing. Do you ever pay it for a title search? It's to make sure it's done correctly. Well, he didn't. And they built the house, and now the builder's trying to work with the two couples to. I mean, the other property's vacant anyway. So it sounded like he was going to get them to try to swap or something. But can you imagine that? You build a it was a six hundred and eighty thousand dollar house on the wrong property. That would wow. But if you that other couple are like, so wait, thank <laughs> you, I got a free house on the deal. Oh, man, okay. it's my house. So what they're talking about is storing a file and then we're verifying the file is correct. You can still see the file. But if we take that file and run it through the same algorithm like SHA one, we should get the same result every time. I did a project in forensics years ago. This was the, the you, know, you know what uh, AD and BC is? Y'all know what that is. After death, before Christ, AM, PM, that kind of stuff. Well, we had BL and AL, before Linda and after Linda. <laughs> we did not have a write block at that point. So I told the students, you know, I, gave them, I had a flash drive with some data on it. I said, I'm going to hand this to you. You're going to image the drive and perform your analysis on the image. So one by one, we're going through the classroom. Students were taking the drive, imaging it, and it gets to Linda. And Linda literally copies her entire folder onto the flash drive. Like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm saving my files on it so I can image it. We're like, well, it proved a very valuable point. I could not reproduce the image. Even, I even deleted everything off of it and put the exact same documents on in the same order. It still was not the same document. So the way that project ended up with, you either had the before Linda or the after Linda image. So you had two different hashes to work with. Wow. But it was a very val valuable point. We, and, uh, actually, tomorrow, there's the uh, um, Jason Streets of Regulars are meeting. That's what I'm lecturing on, imaging, and we're actually going to do that. We're going to image something, modify it slightly, Image it again, and you'll see that the hash totally changes, even if you change one little bit. So that's kind of what you want to happen. And with cryptographic sealing, the file is still visible, but when we hash it, we should still get the same results no matter how many times we hash it. The file was modified in any way. You know, I was actually talking to someone this weekend, uh, uh, Sean Engelbrecht. He's a prior student, now works downtown. But there was this bid that where he's working was supposed to do by a certain day. And the person dropped the ball on it, didn't submit the bid in time. Well, then they faked an email to their boss showing the email that they sent to these people. You know, email is strictly text. You can fake it very easily. The problem is you only faked half the header. You know how when you forward something, it has the original blurb? Well, they only faked half of it. What they did is they took another email, copied it, and faked it. She's like, Look, I said it on such and such date, but they're like, why does this part say the wrong date? Kind of what this is. It was when the file was altered. They couldn't prove it. So, All right, so a cryptographic checksum could be the last block and then encrypted with the document. Okay, So we still see the document. I mean, did you ever get, like, I get it from Tinker all the time. When a lot of people send me stuff from Tinker, it comes with a signature. I cannot verify the signature because I'm not part of the base. I don't have access to the certificate store, the certificate authority on base. But if I did, I could then use that certificate to verify the authenticity of it. I can still see the email. I just can't prove that it was really from Marlene. So you have to know that because, you know, years ago, I mean, like Bill Richards, he was, I think he just retired. He would work at DISA, and he would send something with a certificate, and he would always say, you know, this signature is invalid. You're like, oh, no, what's wrong with this email? And it's because we can't have access to the certificate authority. So we just had to assume that it was a valid email. But in the real world, you know, if you've got some top secret data or something important and you got something which said the signature was invalid or the checksum did not match, 
that point, you say, hey, there's something going on here. Okay? All right, authentication. You can use biometrics. I'm not a real big fan of biometrics, although my iPhone uses it. Has it been proven that it can't be hacked? I don't know that answer. I haven't done the Gumi Bear trick with it. My son, uh, where you can take the Gumi Bear, just like say I put my fingerprint on it. Then you come up behind me with a warm Gumi Bear and just push it on and see if it lets you in. My son, who's now 25, well, yeah, getting ready to be 26, way back when, I had a fingerprint reader. I had the APC brand. Remember APC? They had the little teeny, actually I think I still have one card, the fingerprint reader in my office. And then I had a Microsoft one. The APC one was a glass, literally a glass top, put your, finger, your thumb on. I did that and I was using it. My son walks up behind me with a piece of paper, pushes down on the piece of paper, lets him right in. What it did was it kept my thumbprint on the glass. So uh, then I switched to the Microsoft brand, and it was like a kind of a gel top on it where it wouldn't keep your fingerprint, and he was never able to get through that one. <laughs> but I remember those are Mythbusters episodes about <laughs> biometrics. And they did this one lock that, oh, it can't be broken into, and all this other stuff because it checks the radio frequency, blah, blah, all this stuff the manufacturers said. Oh, what they did was, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, it's Amy and... And, no, it's Jamie and Jamie. the red guy. Right. You could have said it if I didn't ask. Adam, Adam and Jamie. Yeah, Adam. Okay. Adam. Yeah. Well, Adam had to get Jamie's info. So what they did is they got him to drink water where he held the cup. So they got his fingerprint off the cup. Then they enlarged it really huge. Printed it out and cleaned it up with a marker. Then shrunk it back down to the size of a real fingerprint, held it up to lock and let him in. So they proved this whole chicken, the frequency of the grooves is all bogus. It was just a picture. But, you know, I'm just not, I don't know if, the cheap biometrics still suck. They do. We uh, actually upstairs, it's probably still up there. We had an optical scanner, you know, where it reads your eyes. And I've had eye surgery years ago, and it was funny because I could program my eye into it, but I could never authenticate with it. I could sit there, you know, you look at it 50 times like it asked you to, and you know, look at this dot here, look at this dot. It would always program it, but it would never authenticate me. So there's, now there's a lot more that you spend a lot of money on that work fine, but biometric is in from handprints to eyes, you know, retina scans at the NSA a while back. I don't know if they still have it. They had a man trap. That means you basically go into a room. Locks behind you. You can't get out until you're authenticated. Well, according to Dr. Shinoy and even Mark Davis when I was up there, they had a lot of interns over the summer. Once you got hired as an intern, one of your first few days there, it was your turn to go out and get the orange juice for the Friday morning social. So they'd send you out to get two gallons of orange juice. The scale weighs you based on your previous weight, and if you're more than seven pounds off, you fail. Two gallons of orange juice weighs more than seven pounds, so it locks you in the man trap, and the supervisor has to come and get you out. So it's, oh, no. that's so they do stuff like that. But uh -huh. A lot of different biometrics. I mean, you see it on the movies all the time too. Handprints and James Bond would rip the eyeballs out. You know, it's just crazy stuff. Okay, timestamps. Timestamps nowadays prevent replay. Because if something's coming in order, then all of a sudden you get something out of order, you can tell something's been happening. Okay? So timestamps are a big deal. Um, like Windows domains. You know, a lot of places run Windows domains. Probably the most popular domains. Did you know that all domain controllers have to be within five minutes of each other? Uh, and if they don't, I mean, if one of them gets out of sync by more than five minutes, it gets what's called tombstoned. And it's funny because uh, St. Philip Neary... The Catholic school I used to take care of over here, I sold my business, and this guy took over. And he went in and screwed up the, uh, basically changed the administrator password. Because he wasn't helping them, so they called me back to fix it. I didn't charge them any money, I just fixed it. And he got pissed that I was helping them. I'm like, dude, you, it was a church, you weren't helping them. 
So I took care of it. So he remotely went in and changed all the passwords. So we can't get in. Well, what happened was one of the servers happened to be offline, one of the domain controllers. Okay? So it couldn't synchronize. So it didn't get the password updates he'd made. So I turned the pet, I bring the domain controller back online. It just happened that it was off. And it basically went and says, this server has been tombstoned, which basically means it's the dates don't, or the times don't match, because I went and changed the time on it. They didn't match. Then you can make a registry setting where you basically say, override that and make me the master. So I did that on the one that I could get into, the, the one that was turned off. And it literally went in and override all the passwords he did. So I was like, yes. So it worked wow. great. Um, but yeah, time stamps are a really big deal. Chronology, you know, when things happen, I'm getting ready to work on a, actually I've been working on it today, a project for script programming. We're going to be analyzing earthquake data. Kind of important to know when it happened, where it happened, all that kind of stuff. Okay. How about senders and receivers time stamps must match? Now there's an issue with that. Email, for instance. Did you know it actually goes by the server time? Which sucks. There was, for a while back, I used to run an ISP, and I did a lot of stuff with spam. One of the, you know, I don't know how you guys sort your email, but I sort based on received dates, so the new stuff's at the top. Well, for a while, there were those companies that would set the mail server time way ahead, years in advance, so that when their spam would come in, it would instantly go to the very top of my box because it was set to the newest message. So, so there's an issue with timestamps. Okay. All right, encryption modes. We talked about a couple of these, but now we're going to see some more. We already talked about electronic code book, but we're going to talk about cipher block chaining, cipher feedback, and also output feedback as well. Okay, electronic code book. We have our plain text and our key, and we produce our cipher text. Okay, so if we have the same plain text, what happens? What do we get? Same, same cipher text. So I'm encrypting the same plain text every time. I get the same cipher text every time. It's good because it's still encryption, but is it really good? No. Okay. All right. And decrypting the same way. Okay. Cipher key, cipher text key, and we get the same plain text back. Okay. Now each block is encrypted individually. Identical plain text produces identical cipher text. That's electronic code book. I'm pretty sure that's what we talked about last time. Okay. Now let's talk about cipher block chaining. We actually meant, I, I don't know if we mentioned this one, but Take our plain text. Now we use an initialization vector, which we know is best to have a random one. That's encrypted with a key, and it produces ciphertext. But a copy of that ciphertext is also used and XORed with the next plain text. So the second plain text is XORed with the first ciphertext. The third plain text is XORed with the second ciphertext, and so on and so forth. Decryption is similar, okay? We use our initialization vector, but that's XOR after the decryption process. So it's just the order of where it's XOR and where it gets its data from. Okay? So that's cipher block chaining. Okay? So it prevents replay, because now each block is encrypted or XOR with the prior block. So it's always going to change. It's self-healing, because it will fix itself after so many blocks. Okay? And they talk about initialization vector. It's not critical you know how that works because you just saw it in the picture. Okay. Cipher feedback, very similar. Actually, look at that picture real quick, and I'm going to go back. See that one there where we're actually taking, actually, there it is. We're taking the initialization vector, XORing with the plain text at the beginning. Actually, go back one more. And then the cipher text is used for the next one. So this one here, cipher feedback, you'll see that we take the initialization vector. And we're not XORing it at that point. We actually encrypt the initialization vector with a the key, then we XOR in the plain text. So it's a little bit different. You need to be able to identify one of the pictures. Two or three, I don't remember which one. Okay? But cipher feedback is after the fact. Because instead of being XORed at the top, it's actually XORed at the bottom. I see that? Okay. All right. So block nature does is inconvenient. Partial blocks must be padded. Okay. Encryption cannot begin until we get an entire block. Okay. So a block is greater than stream. So usually 
You know, it says encryption errors only affects the next eight blocks or eight characters. So, all right. Now, here's output feedback. Hold on. Yeah, there's cipher feedback. Now we're at output feedback. It's a little different. It's not, you'll see this, the error is not coming from after the XOR position at the bottom. So where it's coming from, remember the, the prior one, the copy was actually taken after the XORing of the plain text. Let me go back and show you again. Yeah, there it is. You'll see it's an XOR with the plain text, and then we take a copy of it. That's cipher feedback. An output feedback, a copy of it is taking prior to the XOR. So there's only four of them you've got to worry about. Okay, only four. But you really only need to worry about one of them. Just don't know which one. Okay. All right, so it's a little bit, just the order of where it's being XORed and taken is very similar. It's just where it's being XORed. Okay. Initialization vectors used, and so on and so forth. All right, that's the end of that. The next lecture, again, is on RSA, which we know is already up there. All right. Stop.